Tonight's program is called Team Photo. Uh, Gina Bivens, who is president of the Grand Rapids Historical Society, is one of four volunteer photo sleuths who go through millions of photographs, literally, <laughs> and digitize them for the Grand Rapids Public Museum. They try to find locations, they try to find information, and that's what she's gonna talk about tonight. So without much further ado, I will hand it over to you, Gina. All right, thank you, Jeff, very much. Um, I am part of Team Photo. Um, we sort of just named ourselves that. Um, so we have all of these wonderful photos in the Grand Rapids Public Museum archives, and we're trying to figure out who, what, where, and when. And unfortunately, although I did post this wonderful picture of these dancing Greek ladies, uh, we still don't know anything about it. So um, I guess that's a spoiler alert. Uh, let me tell you about Team Photo. We came together because we, the four of us love research. We love going down rabbit holes. <clears throat> We're not the first to work on the extensive collection of photographs. A series of staff and interns and volunteers have also contributed. We scan the images. We the staff download them to the database, we research them, and we enter the findings into the computer. And we try to find out who, what, where, and when. We sign a unique number so that it can be found if they don't already have one, which many do not, that are in the museum's collection. We add a geolocation if we know it and enter the box number and folder number location so those photos can be found at a later date, although it's wonderful that they're digitized. So why do we do it? For future researchers and because they let us. And we debated if we should um, downplay how much fun we have and we decided to tell you that we have fun. So each of us, the four of us chose photographs that interested us and hope will interest you. They're from the collection of the Public Museum and can be found at grpmcollections.org. A few were supplemented with more recent photos to add clarity. The first member of Team Photo is, whose picture you're going to see is John Pierce, and he's a member of the West Michigan Genealogical Society, the Ionia County Genealogical Society, and membership chair of the Michigan Genealogical Council. And he volunteers with the city archives also. His first photograph is a portrait of Moses, and I'm going to slaughter this, and I apologize to all my French friends out there, La Borsaliere. And written on the back of this photograph is voice instructor. That made him very curious. So he found out that he was born in Quebec, Canada in 1845. He got married in Chicago to Adele Harbert in 1877, and he died in Los Angeles, California in 1921. The photograph, however, was taken at the Noble Grand Art Studio located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And from the city directories, we see that Moses was involved in Turkish and Russian baths and as a tropodist. And in 19, 1895, he was at the Morton House, but he was living at 183 Grant, uh, 3rd Avenue, which is now known as Grant Southwest. In 1912, he's listed as a tropodist at the Morton House, but his home is on Warren. And in 1919, he's located at 413 Peck Building as a tropodist and living at 153 Lyon. What is a tropodist, you ask? Well, he is a person who treats the feet and its ailments. This photograph is part of a collection donated to the museum by Dorothy O'Brien. There are at least 154 records associated with her, many of them photographs of high school classmates. Moses, the person you're looking at here, was identified when this picture was found in an advertisement in the 1895 Central High School yearbook. And here we have a group of young females. Written on the back is 
Aunt Julie Allen, Zula Cheney, and in parentheses, mom, Aunt Nan McLean, an unknown person, Aunt Ann Hurst, Aunt Kate Walcott. The word aunt is in quotes, which indicated they were aunt's name only, probably not by bloodline, except for mom. Dorothy O'Brien, the donor, is the daughter of Zula Cheney, the one listed as mom. Dorothy O'Brien never married. Her father died when she was a toddler, and her mother remarried, and Dorothy took the stepfather's name. This group of women were high school friends at Central High School, graduating in the mid-1890s. This is a grand champion steer, and it's shown by the Har Harold Harwood, and the Harwood Farm is located south of Ionia, Michigan. An article in the September 4th, 2021 Sentinel Standard featured Quentin and Linda Harwood about their upcoming induction into the Michigan Farmers Hall of Fame. Quentin served as the beef cattle superintendent of the Ionia Free Fair for 40 years and is the son of Harold, who is pictured above. How many of you have attended the Ionia Free Fair? The camera shot number on the back is 33612, which tells us that this photo was taken in 1933. That's quite the large animal. And to go with that, we have a photograph that's showing the inside of a butcher shop. Animal corpses hang from racks and there are piles of meat all over the counters and on scales. Also note, note this platoon strategically placed. Imagine no air conditioning. We're gonna travel a little outside of Grand Rapids, but it does have a connection. This photograph is of a group of four women and two children in front of stacks of logs in Luther, a Northern Michigan town. Workers in the logging industry were predominantly male. However, women were involved in supportive efforts and domestic duties. The village of Luther was established in 1880 by Wilson, Luther and Wilson lumbering firms. The Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad built a station in Luther during the rise of the logging industry. The town was organized as a village in 1881 and the original plat of Luther was recorded in 1882. The logging industry continued to be the major employer in the Luther area for many decades. Luther still exists, located in Lake County. I wonder if some of these logs were headed to Grand Rapids for the making of furniture. Just a lovely picture of a cook shanty, two men, a woman, and a child. They're waiting for the lumbermen to arrive for their meal, circa 1880. Here we have a photograph of four African-American men working together to fell a tree in northern Michigan. Mature trees often required several men to take it down. Logs were typically hauled by horse-drawn carts and brought to a nearby river, or a railway for transport. There are over 450 records that appear when photograph logging is typed into the search bar. And that doesn't include lumbering. And just if you typed in photograph logging, you would get over 450 records. We could not resist putting this in. This is the call to dinner. It's from an 1880s and another cook's shanty, but the guy who just had that beautiful call to dinner horn is posing just before mealtime, I would assume. And so I think the man, we, we believe that the man with the checked apron is the same one we just saw. And here's a photograph of a logging train with multiple loaded cars. This picture, as well as the cook shanty and the call to dinner photo are part of seven logging pictures from the same donor, former East Grand Rapids Mayor, John Collins. And here is a photograph of a crushed car that has been hit by a train. 
A crowd has gathered to inspect the wreckage. Today, there's a lot of safety equipment on cars that might have made this level of destruction a little less likely. Polish military band, Grand Rapids. How do we know it? It's on the bass drum. But we don't know who they are or what year this was taken. But they are a fine looking group of musicians. On the other hand, the Pulaski Cornet Band of 1881 is pictured here. How do we know all of this? Well, they have a nice banner across the top of the photo. That makes it easier. From left to right on the uh, front row, we have S. Lipinski, G. F. Albrecht, who is the leader, M. Spupecki, F. Lesek, A. Berman, J. Kala, T. Leisky, and A. Andrzejewski. The back row, we have M. Shar, J. Daniski, J. Karowski, and B.B. Santilli. This is a photograph of the intersection of Monroe and Ottawa. Herpelsheimers can be seen on the left side of the photograph. This building would later be sold to Wurzburgs. The Whittacombe building with spires can be seen further down the street on the left. The Hotel Pantland is straight ahead in the center of the picture. The flags bear the insignia of the Red Arrow Division, which was created to serve in World War I and made up of National Guardsmen from both Wisconsin and Michigan and earned its trademark insignia from its penetration of every German line of defense it faced. The visible portion of the Pantland Hotel, because it was built in sections, was built in 1923. So this would be dated after that. And here is the insignia of the Red Arrow Division. It was photographed when the museum's clothing collection was documented. Here we have a picture of a fire at 1222 South Division, 1965. This fire started January 28, 1965 in the late afternoon. The even numbered street address of 1222 South Division puts these businesses on the west side of the street, which means we are looking south from Hall Street. The 1964 directory lists the following businesses in that block. 1208 is being vacant. 1210, Jack Emmons Tavern. 1212, 16 and 18 are vacant. And 1220 is Paris Refrigeration. 1222 is Cook's Tire Shop. And 1224 is Chapton Secondhand Furniture. Then Zeno Street comes in from the east. This photograph was donated in 1984 by the Grand Rapids Fire Department Station Number 1. Here is the press article about it. The losses are estimated to be 150,000 to 175,000. The firefighters worked in 7 degree temperatures. And Russell Paris, who operated the refrigeration equipment store on the, with his son, battled the flames with extinguishers before firefighters arrived, but were unable to halt the blaze. It is believed that fire started in Cook's Tire Shop and the roof collapsed over the tire shop in Paris's store. And Chapton's secondhand store beside Cook's was damaged extensively by heat, water, and smoke. The blaze was called in at 4 to 14 Thursday, and the last truck did not leave until 3 a.m. on Friday. And another picture of a fire. Uh, this is a streetcar, the streetcar barn on fire. We're looking at the intersection of Wealthy, Lake Drive, and Norwood. Kroger has very recently moved into their new store 
and that's the building occupied now by CVS Pharmacy. It is at the bottom center of the photo. Gino's Pizza is in the lower right, and at the top center is the East Town Theater, now a church. And here's the article from the paper. And to quote, the largest array of firefighting equipment in Grand Rapids history fought an estimated $400,000 fire for 10 hours. On Thursday and early Friday, they saved seven businesses from destruction as flames swept the upper rear floor of the former Old East Car Bar building at 1514 Wealthy. The 18 lane East Recreation Bowling Alley on the ground floor at the rear of the building suffered extensive smoke and water damage as firemen fought flames which started in an unclaimed freight warehouse on the second floor. And John's final selection is the Barth House. The photograph is of the 147 to 149 East Fulton. It is the home and the office of Dr. Lewis Barth. And as early as 1898, Dr. Barth was located here. It has since been raised. <clears throat> the city directory in 1932 listed as the home of Miss Alona Barth. In 1935, 147 is the office of Lewis H. Chamberlain, a surgeon, and then Alona Barth is living next door. And in 1939, the bu building is being used for doctor's office. Doc Dr. Barth lived from 1860 to 1932 and is buried at Oak Hill Cemetery, as well as his wife, Alona, <coughs> who lived from 1864 to 1939. The next member of Team Photo is Sue Bogard. She's a member of West Michigan Genealogical Society, also volunteers on local history projects for the Granville's Public Library and the City Archives. Her first choice, is the Alden Smith home and the Wurzburgs girls. This photograph is identified in the camera shop index as Wurzburg girls with Packard car at William A. Smith Jr. residence. It tells us it was taken for the Herald on March 18, 1922. We wonder if these girls were promoting Wurzburgs, there were Stuckey's girls in the 50s and 60s, um, or were they actually Wurzburg by name? The house was located at 1869 Robinson Road. William Alden Smith Jr. and his wife Marie lived there. Interestingly though, in 1914, the address was 1669. It then changed to 1769, and then later date changed to the 1869 address. The house was eventually sold to the Reformed Bible Institute, and the final owner was Aquinas College. They had the house raised in 1991 and built the Jarecki Lacks Center. It has a camera shop number of 22444, which lets us know that it is 1922. And this is a view of the house from Robinson Road in a photo taken by Laura Lawrenson in 1958. You would have seen this from Robinson Road. This is another photo taken by Laura Lawrenson. The Grand Rapids Public Library has some taken by her in its collection. And it is in their archive description that we found out the name of this photographer. The ones in the museum's photo collection were found in a metal box in the archives with no information regarding the photographer. Ironically, Laura Lawrenson worked at the public museum in the 40s and 50s. So this is the Dudley Waters Mansion or home located at 20 College Southeast. He was involved in many business ventures in Grand Rapids the Waters building at the corner of Ottawa and Pearl may be the one most Grand Rapidians are familiar with. This house 
is still standing on College Southeast behind the modern condo building at 30 College. And as far as we know, our information is that it's been divided into four condominium units. And this photo was most likely taken in the 1950s. And just if you're not familiar with the Waters building, this is what it looked like in 1910. Doesn't look that much different today. This hand tinted postcard shows the Waters building in 1910. We are looking southwest from the corner of Ottawa and Lyon with the Ledyard building to the left of it. Built as a furniture exhibition building, it is today occupied by Sundance Grill, Homewood Suites, and other businesses. As a furniture exhibition building, furniture manufacturers, local and national, would rent suites of rooms in which to show their latest creations. Grand Rapids was hosting twice yearly furniture markets, and these showrooms allowed companies to keep a presence in Grand Rapids throughout the year. The date on the cornerstone of this building, 1898. Here we have a photograph of the 1925-26 medical residents at Butterworth Hospital. And they are identified. We have from left to right, Dr. Panzma, Dr. Hare, Dr. Chandler, Dr. Poppin, and Dr. Thomas. And the next row, Dr. Killebrew, Dr. Jones, Dr. Penoyer, Dr. Gleason, and Dr. Veltman. The men in this photograph were identified when Sue found the names on history.spectrumhealth.org Butterworth Hospital history. So we do go out of our way to identify people. So that has been put in the museum's information in their session record. We know the year because it has a camera shop number. This one has a camera shop number starting with a 2A, and we know they are Butterworth nurses, but they are unidentified. It is now Butterworth Hospital, if you don't know, is now known as Spectrum Butterworth. We could not find them in the index the, that we do have. Here's Butterworth Hospital in 1925. It is a camera shop picture, and it does have the 25867 tells us it was taken in 1925. Sue and I both love this photo. We are looking northeast from the top of the hill behind Mount Mercy Academy, which was located at 1425 Bridge Northwest. It was an all-girls school run by the Sisters of Mercy. Obviously, this is a gym class, and I want you to check out the Bloomers. Built in 1917 as a Catholic convent and private school, Mount Mercy was acquired by the Grand Rapids Housing Commission in 1991 and was renovated to provide affordable retirement apartments. As we were researching this photo by zooming in, we found some interesting things. A large area in the distance is undeveloped. We found out it was a sand and gravel operation. The 1918 City Directory lists Harrison Land Company, sand and gravel at 1023 4th Street Northwest. The only address listed on the north side of the street between Lane and Pine. The company was run by Edward J. and Frederick A. Voss. There are a few houses going up in the cleared area, including one on Pine between 4th and Walker, a couple on 5th, and one on Gravel Place Northwest. The gravel place name was changed to Pat Northwest, which you get off Walker, the first street west of Fremont. Basically, the gravel mining went on in an area bordered by Gravel Place, Pine, Fourth, and Walker. The, the, 
the smoke on the horizon to the right of the tree or the discolored area to the right of the tree comes from factories along Broadway and 7th. And when we zoomed way in, we could see the distinct roof line of the American Seeding Company. And zooming in a little more, the house with the arrow above it is located at 744 Pine Northwest and was being built in 1928. So now we know the photo was taken in 1928 or after. Sometimes we go very deep into the rabbit hole. This is the house at 744 Pine, built in 1928. The city's assessor office information. Go to the city of Grand Rapids Resident Services property lookup. This house clicked with me because our daughter Chris hung out with Susan Dombrowski in junior high, and this is where Susan lived. This is a photograph of two-year-old Elaine Jean Newman sitting inside a small wagon pulled by a goat. The wagon has Grand Rapids and 1929 painted on the front. It was taken in front of her grandparents' home at 1322 Boston Street. Elaine's parents moved into the home during the Depression. A door-to-door -door photographer went around taking photographs of children in his wagon pulled by a goat at the cost of 25 cents. Elaine was born in Grand Rapids in 1927, the daughter of Lebanese immigrants. And we know all this because the photograph was donated in 2007 by the grandson of the girl in the photograph. And because we have another picture of an adorable child with, in a cart being pulled by a goat, we thought you'd wanna see it too. Notice the date of 1924. So we wonder if they came every year with the cart and goat. I'm assuming they did. Here we have a photograph of the Centennial Arch erected in Grand Rapids for the 100th anniversary celebration of the Union. The arch is 64 feet wide and 70 feet high. It was designed by Colonel Joseph Penny and erected in Campo Square by Mr. C.H. Gifford. The Suites Hotel can be seen in the background on the left and through the center of the arch. The Pantland Hotel was later erected in that space and today is known as the Amway Grand Plaza Hotel. This celebration took place July 4th, 5th and 6th. The city was also celebrating its 50th anniversary of the founding of Grand Rapids. Some of this information came from the Historical Commission website, historygrandrapids.org. And not to be outdone, us West Siders, <clears throat> um, this is the West Bridge Street Centennial Celebration Arch. The description in the record is photograph of West Bridge Street during the 1876 U.S. Centennial Celebration. We're looking west and the spire of St. James can be seen in the distance through the center of the arch. I tried to find these buildings to see if they're still standing and had no luck. That does not mean they are not there. In 1898, Frank Lemon, who you see pictured here, went into partnership with Arthur Rosenthal as trick cyclists. They toured America from 1900 to 1904 under the name of Rose and Lemon and performed bicycle and unicycle tricks. In 1904, Lemon came up with the idea of a steel spherical cage that motorcycles could be ridden in and was later patented by Rosenthal. That same year, the two traveled Europe and performed at fairs, amusement parks, vaudeville shows, burlesque shows, their act was known as the Globe of Death, as they rode in the cage on motorcycles going 40 to 50 miles an hour. As cinemas came popular, that declined. And in 1919, Rosenthal left the partnership to create Rose Swift 
airplane service in Grand Rapids. Lemon continued performing with the Globe of Death until 1927. He then formally retired and began a career as a maintenance engineer for Rosenthal. His company then was Rose Patch and Label. And although he no longer performed the Globe of Death routine, Lemon continued riding his motorcycle and performing tricks until the age of 80. Most of these performances were done for veterans and charities. Frank Lemon was born in 1881. He married Pearl Bernice Murphy in 1912, and he passed away in 1963 at the age of 82. Also, it should be mentioned that the museum has unicycles and a bicycle from this act in their archives, in their collections. This photograph is part of a collection that chronicles the brief existence of the DeVoe Hall Motor Corporation, an automobile manufacturing company in Grand Rapids that sprang up at the beginning of the Great Depression and then quickly went out of business. One of the few remaining fully restored DeVos is on display at the Grand Rapids Public Museum. Here we have a photograph that shows the first DeVoe 6-75 custom sedan made in Grand Rapids. The Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper dated April 19, 1931 page 46, published this picture with the following caption. Impressive ceremony at launching of America's newest motor car, the DeVoe 6-75 Custom Sedan. Mrs. Hall, the wife of Colonel Albert Hall, vice president of the company, officiated. Left to right, Mrs. George R. Scott, Mr. Scott, vice president of manufacturing. And they actually gave, say, the DeVoe motor car, Colonel Albert J. Hall, Vice President Engineering, Mrs. E.J. Hall, George W. Brown, the Milwaukee DeVoe distributor, and Edward Roche, plant manager. The plant was located at 625 7th Street Northwest between Muskegon and Davis. And I just threw this in because I thought you'd want to see what a beautiful car it was inside. This is a 32 DeVoe interior. Here we have a photograph of the Lions Club banquet. We have a lot of banquet pictures. We know this one was held in the Pantland Boat Hotel ballroom by seeing interior pictures of the ballroom from that time period. This may be during the International Convention held July 17th through 20th, 1934 in Grand Rapids. A very large group of men, and we only find one lady, sit at long cloth covered tables. On the wall on the left hangs an American flag and a Lions Club International emblem and banner. And a small group wearing Mexico City ribbons on their lapels sit at the table in the lower left and a few are at other tables. Here we have the Lions International Parade, 1934. This photograph shows a parade celebrating the Lions International Convention on Lower Monroe. There's a lion float um, and with women on it and Grand Rapids written on the side. We are looking north on Monroe from plural and the Pantland Hotel is on the left where the viewing stands are located. Here we have a photograph, the groundbreaking for the All Gas Wonder House in Ottawa Hills, located on the southeast corner of Alexander and Cambridge. The men are identified. It is Bert Schroeder, Secretary of the Grand Rapids Gas Light and Kent Gas Company, Eugene Goebel, Glenn Chamberlain, President and General Manager of the Gas Light and Kent Gas Company, Harold Fletcher of Fletcher Realty, Headquarters for Ottawa Hills Land Company, and Dwight Owen, Vice President and General Superintendent of Owen, Ames, and Kimball. And here is the house in 1936 at its opening. This is from the collection of the Grand Rapids Public Library. And then a more recent picture, and quite honestly, taken off of Zillow. 
Chris Kalpa is on the board of the Grand Rapids Historical Society, currently serving as chair of the program committee, and he grew up on the north end of Grand Rapids. Here we have a photograph of the Burleson building at 150 East Fulton. The city directory listed as rectal specialist, John D. Burleson, physician. Uh, from the Burlesons of Michigan, page three, it says, in 1911, they moved into the seven-story building known as Wellington Flats, and the Burleson was established. This is quite a magnificent entry. And I don't know how well you can see this, but it does show just how large this was. This is a deck of playing cards that, was, uh, that is in the museum's collection with the Burleson. If you want to know more, there is a book about the Burlesons. Um, the Burlesons of Michigan by S.R. Bell. I show this because it is the Willard Building, but most of us call it the Peacock Building. It's got wonderful terracotta decoration around the facade. Uh, it is named for Willard Burleson, the founder of the sanitarium. It was built in 1930 after the Wellington Flats uh, building was de demolished. And over the last century, Pine Rest, a private psychiatric institution, has grown from its humble origins on the Cutler Farm out in Cutlerville into a multi-state facility with international reputation for state-of-the-art care. To celebrate their centennial, their staff and volunteers gathered together many artifacts and documents and photographs to help document their history. Following the celebration, the staff from the Public Museum collaborated with them to collect the archive material in this collection as well as almost 100 artifacts. And here's Sunshine Hospital, located on Fuller, north of the one I-196 Expressway, it was a tuberculosis treatment center. Note the roof line decorations. Can you see it here? Chris captured this pic current picture of the same building with new additions surrounding it. It was for a long time known as Kent Community Hospital, but now is part of the Spectrum Health System. Typed on a piece of paper on the back of this photograph are the names of some of the officers. We have Joe, and I don't know if it's left to right, but it's Joseph Morrissey, William Lennon, Lyman Faust, George Burleson, John Byrne, Charles Clashley, and Sergeant George Spring. They are sitting on or standing next to their Harley Davidson motorcycles. We're jumping ahead almost 20 years, and this photograph shows Grand Rapids Police Headquarters building located at the northeast corner of Crescent in Ottawa with five possibly new squad cars and a group of police officers standing out front. Note the great entrance to this building. And this shows the police headquarters probably shortly after it was built. Same as the one you just saw, but it's the whole building. Crane's Museum of Freaks, Snakes, and Whiskered Ladies was located on Pearl Street just west of the arcade. The proprietor of the business was Elliot H. Crane. The first floor of the building was Houseman and May Clothier, owned by Julius Houseman and Moses May. Hogaboom Brothers Cigar Stores is to the right in the arcade, and the building to the left of the museum is the California White House with D. Perry as proprietor. Flanagan's Bar is where Cranes stood. The arcade is the alleyway that runs along the east side of Flanagan. Baxter's history of Grand Rapids indicates that a fire on October 30th, 1872 burned buildings each way from the Lovett Block, which was located on the northeast corner of Canal, now known as Monroe. I don't believe it's the same building as Flanagan's, unless it was rebuilt about wrong what was left. They do not look the same. Uh, Mr. Crane was one out of business uh, before right after the fire, but he is listed from 1873 to 1875 as living in the city and as a taxidermist. The waiting room of the Union train station. It was located at Ionia, 
immediately south of Weston. Hopcat is currently located on the corner of Weston and Iona as a reference. The public museum used photos like this and old blueprints to build the train station waiting room, which is an entrance into the streets of Old Grand Rapids exhibit. And here's an exterior of that train station. Here we're looking north on Jefferson from State. This is an early 1930s photograph taken at the corner of Jefferson where it meets Washington on the right, leading to State Street, which is not pictured. The Lysen Funeral Home is pictured on the left. To the right of the funeral home is the museum annex in a house. The four-story building was the lit one Goodyear's tire store. The building still stands today. The Willard Building is next, and then Fulton Street can be seen in the distance. And in the center of the photograph, you should be able to see the house with the pillars that was built in the Civil War era and was home of John J. Godfrey. The Ken Scientific Museum is out of sight on the right behind the cannon. And here is the Kent Scientific Museum that you cannot see in the previous picture. Note the cannon and large stone that were visible in the previous image. And here's what it looks like today. Westminster Presbyterian Church Annex has taken up the area where the houses stood. The tire building remains, though no longer a tire store. The Willard building is behind the row of trees. And St. Cecilia's Music Society building, built in the 1880s, is visible at the juncture of Jefferson and Fulton. The 1938 Public Museum building, barely visible on the right, replaced Kent Scientific and is today the Museum High School, part of the Grand Rapids public school system. Thank you for the photo, Chris Kalpa. Here we have the intersection of Fulton and Market, looking southwest most likely taken from an upper floor of the building that now houses the Bob. In 1929, city directory lists Henry DeGrasse soft drinks at Six Market and Lee and Katie wholesale grocers at 18 to 24 Market Northwest. Market Northwest, until decades later, ran from Fulton to Monroe, which we now call Monroe Center, Brianna Taylor Way, which does make it confusing when doing research. Check out all the traffic. Here we have a photograph of 1331 Plainfield Northeast, the home of Maurice and Julia McClay Shanahan. Maurice Shanahan was the treasurer of the Bissell Carpet Sweeper Company until his death in 1910. Shanahan bought a plot of orchard land from Abel Page to build this house in 1890. He married Julia McClay and they had seven children. After Julia's death in 1929, the children remained in possession of the house until 1938 when they sold it to John Kukalar, who in turn in 1943 sold it to Lawrence Van Zee, who was his nephew, and then turned it into the Creston Funeral Home. Today, the address is 1331 Carmen, the street that runs along the east side of the building. This is another Laura Lawrenson photograph. And here is what we see today. You have to look behind or beyond the building at 1330 Plainfield to see the Shanahan house, a hidden gem. And, his, and here we have a building that people of a certain age in Grand Rapids will remember very well, Betty Trill's Texaco. Um, 1912 lists it as the Church of Good Shepherd, 1929 um, is the McLaren Auto Service in 1949. It's listed as McKinney Brothers Gas Station, but in 1953, Elizabeth A. Trill, the widow of William H., living at 501 Michigan and Trill's Texaco Service with Mrs. Elizabeth Trill as owner. So that's where Betty lived and the business was. Today, a parking lot for a medical building at 515 Michigan. And again, a photo credit to Chris Kalka. I'm on the board of the Grand Rapids Historical Society. I spent many years in education, public programming, and working with the archives at the Public Museum. And here are my choices. Not the best picture, but it was key to unlocking 
Other photos, this photo was taken downtown at the corner of Weston and LaGrave with engine house number one on the right side. The photograph is identified in the camera shop index as being taken on March 12, 1923 of Winnick Brothers Iron and Metal Company truck taken for Golden Motor Sales. The 1923 Grand Rapids City Directory lists the Winnick Brothers at 455 6 Northwest and identifies them as wholesale dealers in and graders of rags, rubber, iron, paper, and metal. But it shows the Golden Motors at 49 to 59 LaGrave, which puts them kitty corner or at the southwest corner of Weston on LaGrave. We have the date taken because the museum has in its archives an index for the camera shop photos that were taken from 1919 to 1925. We do not have the other volume and they only have listings from N through Z. So we got lucky that it wasn't alphabetized by Golden, but by Winnick. And here is a photograph of a stake bed truck for the Grand Rapids Bedding, uh, which was located at 5264 Summer. The truck is parked on the grave on the east side of the street facing north with Westminster Presbyterian in the background. It took us a while to figure out which church is in the background. The brick was not unlike St. Mary's on Turner or St. James on Bridge or Emmanuel Lutheran on Michigan Northeast or any other number of churches that no longer stand. Then we found the previous photo taken by the camera shop for Golden Motors and realized this is Westminster prior to being painted and prior to the addition on the South for daycare, which blocks the entrance seen in this photo. We confirm by matching up the stained glass window pattern. And it really does make a difference once they paint the brick. This picture really has a lot going on. It shows three houses in the foreground with many houses far in the background, a large sign to the left of the two houses, uh, right of, reads Ottawa Hills. The house under construction on the left is located at 1580 Mackinac Southeast. The house to the right of center are facing Alexander Street and are 1565 and 1569 Alexander. The house in the distance on the right on the curve street is at 1138 Cadillac. We know it was taken in 1927. And I will say that crowdsourcing, meaning I put it up on social media, really helped with this identification. This is a close up of the backs of the houses on Alexander and the sign that indicates that it's Ottawa Hills. I have an arrow pointing to it. Here we have a picture of South High School Senior Banquet in 1925. It's identified again by the camera shop. It's taken. February 23rd, 1925. We're not quite sure where this was taken, but our best guess is the school because of the crepe paper ceiling decoration. And we're guessing that they are holding balloons and not bowling balls and basketballs, unless they were on sports teams. As, well, as we go through the photographs, we're acutely aware of gaps in stories being told and that many groups of people are underrepresented. So we are glad to find information on this photograph so we could give it context noting that it is an integrated group. This photograph shows a large number of people standing on either side of two bowling lanes. There are three men behind the pins. It appears this is a factory building by the style of construction. Some of the people appear to be dressed in work clothes. Some are in office clothes. There are a number of women in the photo. Wouldn't it be wonderful to figure out who built this bowling alley in a factory? Any ideas? There are a number of photographs like this in the archives, groups of unidentified people. Pictures like this beg to have identification done, and obviously they are boxers. Was this a boxing club, golden gloves? It is integrated, check the back row out, help. I did find out on michigangoldengloves.com his slash history that in 1931, the Grand Rapids Press acquired the right to conduct the Michigan Golden Gloves and the first, golden, uh, first Michigan Golden Gloves contest was held. Could this be some boxers from that contest? The camera shop number tells us it was taken in 1931. I put this up at the last minute 
Um, this is, John recently photographed a number of the oversized pictures, too big to scan, and this is one of them. Um, it's the Centennial of the Star School, and they're celebrating at Johnson Park. I couldn't remember where, I couldn't figure out where Star School was, and then people on the internet kind of hit me in the forehead and said, um, it was located at Lincoln and 8th in Ottawa County and later moved to the Blanford Nature Center. So thank you to everyone who helped with the information. This photo is intriguing on close inspection. The Cafe du Commerce has a painted false facade. I actually laughed out loud when I realized that. The world is in the middle of the Great Depression. Was this designed to lighten people's spirits? It is on the property of the city farmer's market that was located on Leonard Street Northwest, just west of the Grand River. The water treatment plant located on Monroe North of Leonard can be seen in the distance to the right of the cafe. We know it was taken in 32 because of the camera shop number. Youth talent exhibit at the public museum at 54 Jefferson. I entered the baking category and made a banana cake with cream cheese frosting. Yes, I remember. I was very proud. I might've been in seventh or eighth grade. This photo was recently uh, re-photographed by John and uploaded and it came from the oversized box cabinet, the oversized cabinet that John has been working on. We're looking east, northeast at the corner of Monroe and Lyon. This is known as the Twomley block. In 1938, city directory lists Bosch Jewelers at 200 Monroe. 202 lists a number of tenants, most likely those occupying upper floors. And then 204, Leonard's Boot Shop. And the building that you can only partially see to the left was Grinnell Brothers Music House. Looking northeast at the same corner, 1967, the Michigan Consolidated Gas Company being built during the urban renewal of the 1960s, not quite finished in this photo. You can see the ironwork for City Hall going up. The press building is up in the distance. This is from the Seymour Beaver collection. Today, this corner looks different again. The corner building was refaced. The Calder Plaza building, the city building, the county building are up. And the press building in the distance was demolished and the MSU research facility is now at the northeast corner of Michigan and Monroe. On this Veterans Day, we honor those who have served with an undated photograph of a parade heading east on Monroe at Fulton toward Veterans Park, less than a block away. Monument Park Civil War statue is off to the left. And for those who do not know, Monroe once extended through the short block from Division to Fulton. Monument Square building, where the Children's Museum is located today, can be seen on the right. And here's a wonderful June 1969 of Veterans Park. From left to right in the distance, we can see the former YMCA, now the Fitzgerald Living Spaces, the pylons in Veterans Park, and the Grand Rapids Public Library. Here's a picture of the Children's Museum. We've talked a lot about the camera shop, so I wanted to show you where it was located. It had two entrances, and I do not believe that these buildings were connected. So maybe they just, well, that's what they did. The last photograph shows a poster in the window on the right that says, there is a May cruise dance to be held at the Pantland Hotel Ballroom Saturday, May 15th, 1926 with the Dietrich Orchestra, and it's being put on by the Mount Mercy alumni. The camera shop, which was located at 16 Monroe and 2123 Sheldon Northeast. Do you suppose this classy lady is putting in a roll of film that has an image that we saw today? Thousands of pictures in the museum archive are from the camera shop. More than 2,900 camera shop images have been totally processed so far, along with thousands of other images donated by others. The camera shop was formed in 1908 by Walter Schmidt to provide photo supplies to the Grand Rapids Kent County, Michigan community. He retained ownership until 1936 and all of the known photographs 
which carry the camera shop markings come from the era of Schmidt's ownership. Team Photo wants to say thank you to the staff of the Public Museum of Grand Rapids, the Community Archives Research Center staff, and for all of your help. We want to thank the museum for letting us help identify photographs. We hope this inspires you, the viewers, to go to grpmcollections.org and scroll through the pictures.